welcome to the podcast of English composer Andrew Downs. My name is Paula Downs, I'm Andrew's younger daughter, and on today's show I'm going to be reading Chapter 8 from my granddad's book Around the Horn by Frank Downs. Chapter 8 includes Tour of Europe, 2nd Tactical Air Force HQ, Brussels, Forward Airfields, Belgium, V-1 Flying Bombs, Broadcasting from Brussels. I return now to England 1944, when on December the 12th, another group of RAF musicians, including myself, left for Europe, exactly 12 days after the others went west. Whereas the first party left Euston by train, seen off by relatives and friends, we left camp at midnight in two lorries under what seemed to be a veil of secrecy. Both groups were heading for unknown destinations, in spite of the fact that we had changed our money, what little we had, to Belgian francs, and they had theirs in dollars. It was bitterly cold and raining heavily as we trundled along in the pitch-black night on our way to blast a hole in Hitler's fortress. There was plenty of speculation as to where we were heading. Southampton, Dover, Plymouth, Harwich... Portsmouth and Hull were all listed as certainties in the betting stakes. In fact, the journey became a mystery tour when we arrived dog-tired, cold, wet and hungry at Old Serum Camp, Salisbury Plain. The whole area seemed to be waterlogged as the heavy rain continued to pour throughout the day. We were shown to our sleeping quarters, First World War bell tents, And I must admit that even today, the mere thought of being under canvas on Salisbury Plain in December makes me shudder. Each tent was equipped with slatted duck boards as a protection against the soggy floor. Without doubt, it was going to be an uncomfortable night. There was very little comfort on the following day either, as the deluge continued. In an effort to combat the sheer boredom, several of us made our way to the camp cinema, where a free film show had been advertised over the camp loudspeakers. Several hundred others on the site had the same idea, and we found ourselves at the rear of the queue. Still it poured, and with water dripping off our service caps, we eventually made an entrance. The cinema was packed to the doors already, and as we searched for vacant seats, we came across a whole row of empty chairs about midway down the auditorium. We made a beeline for them, and as we sat down, scarcely believing our good fortune, we were aware of an uncanny silence falling over the rest of the audience, the sort of silent expectancy one experiences before lights dim as the curtain goes up on the first night of a new play. Within a few minutes, we knew why the seats were vacant. A virtual torrent cascaded from the ceiling above. The cinema erupted with whistles and laughter as we scurried to the back of the audience where we stood to watch the next unfortunates. Apparently, the leak in the roof was part of the pre-film entertainment. We moved camp at midnight this time as part of a long convoy of vehicles of various shapes and sizes, including many armoured cars. It had stopped raining, but it was still bitterly cold, and as we travelled through the night, I began to have severe pain in my feet. We arrived at a transit camp near Hounslow. I could hardly walk, and I shall be eternally grateful to the CO of that camp who welcomed us at 4am with hot tea and sandwiches. Seeing my plight, he took me to his quarters and bathed my feet in hot water to combat the early stages of frostbite. Where on earth were we going? That was the question which occupied us as we continued on our journey. We seemed to be travelling along countless secondary roads to avoid towns and were amazed when we eventually arrived some hours later in the vicinity of Tilbury Docks. So, we had trekked from London to the depths of Wiltshire to return to a port on the southeast coast a few miles from London in order to join a convoy bound for the continent of Europe. 
I suppose the military minds had their reasons, but I find it hard to believe that our journey to Salisbury Plain was necessary when we could have easily joined the convoy at Tilbury, direct from London. Again we were under canvas, but thankfully we found our accommodation dry, warmer and altogether more comfortable. Opting for an early night, we all settled down to catch up on the many hours of lost sleep. I was detailed to wake our party at 0600 hours in preparation for our embarkation the next morning. My watch checked and with a great coat as a pillow, I snuggled under a couple of blankets amidst a chorus of snoring from those fortunate individuals already in the land of Nod. Never a very good sleeper and anxious not to oversleep, I slept fitfully. Then, waking with bleary eyes, I glanced at my watch. By the dim light of a hurricane lamp burning in the middle of the tent, it appeared to be six o'clock. Grunts and groans greeted my waking call. Round the tents I stumbled, shouting the conventional, show a leg, etc. I was soon to regret my enthusiasm, as disgruntled colleagues discovered I had misread my watch. It was 12.30am. It took many months to live down that episode. By the grey light of dawn, Tilbury docks were a hive of activity. Military equipment of all kinds, including tanks, was being loaded as we embarked, and this continued throughout the day. This ship was one of the TLC, Tank Landing Craft category. I knew little and still know little of the technicalities or design of such ships, but I do remember the sickly smell of oil from the engine room, which was in close proximity to our sleeping quarters. I also remembered with dread previous experiences aboard ship, as even the rocking movement of a rowing boat on the local lake would set off a queasy stomach. I was in all respects a hopeless sailor, and as soon as I was able I made my way to the upper deck to breathe fresh air. The view down river on this grey misty day revealed a convoy of ships behind us, seemingly lining up for the night crossing to some point on the continent. Belgium seemed the most likely destination from Tilbury, we thought, and so it proved to be many hours later. We moved off mid-afternoon, but only as far as South End, where we dropped anchor. The convoy of considerable size behind and in front of us looked formidable, and though in the swell I was already feeling distinctly uneasy, I was even more so when I was detailed together with my brother to take first watch and to patrol the ship on the lower deck. Before this, however, we witnessed an incredible sight from the upper deck. It was late evening, and from a pitch-black sky, what appeared to be a shooting star streaked in from an easterly direction. Within seconds, there was an almighty explosion from the direction of South End. The force of the explosion shook the ship as it lay anchor. We learned later that it was a V2 rocket. Moving off just before midnight, the hours to come were the most uncomfortable I had yet experienced. As we reached the open sea, it was obvious that this was going to be a very rough crossing. The construction of the ship, made really for landing on beaches, rolled and tossed continuously, so much so that I became helplessly sick and remained that way for the whole of the 12-hour crossing, to what turned out to be Belgium, Ostend in fact. Mines and other obstacles had caused many problems on the way. We landed on the beach and transport was waiting to take us to Brussels, which was to be our headquarters for the next few months. The journey was a tedious one, taking many hours through the highways and byways of Belgium. Within minutes of being installed in our billets, a large barracks in the city centre, we had first-rate evidence of the pernicious propaganda of the German occupation. Exhortations in words and pictures were all pervading. Sleeping quarters, dining rooms, ablutions, recreation rooms, kitchens and stores were plastered with illustrations glorifying war, the Führer and the Fatherland. I recall my first visit to the ablutions, looking up at the wall above the wash basins and seeing... We must be ready to die for our Führer. It was a depressing sight to say the least. 
It was good, however, to feel the warmth of welcome from the Belgian people, and in a few days, thanks to the concession of free travel on their efficient but overcrowded trams, we were able to get acquainted with the city. The Palais Residence, a pre-war hotel, was RAF headquarters, and it was from there that we received instructions, beginning with broadcasts from Brussels radio station, public concerts in the city, and a tour of 2nd Tactical Air Force forward aerodromes, where entertainment was extremely limited. Our first broadcast was a memorable one. To be beamed, we were informed, on British propaganda radio to Germany. Before a distinguished audience, including an air marshal, we were to play a programme of British music, Elgar, Sullivan and McCunn. There were mishaps in the first and second pieces. Elgar's pomp and circumstance was spirited enough, but an over-enthusiastic percussionist dropped a cymbal which spun out of control down the tiered platform and ended with a crash at the feet of the surprised air marshal. The programme continued with music from the gondoliers and William Bill Overton, our solo cornet, came to the microphone to play the inevitable Sparkling Eyes solo, which he had played with great success in many halls and bandstands. He was an incredibly gifted musician and trumpet player, with some years of experience in the pre-war BBC Empire Orchestra. But on this occasion, disaster threatened. He was given the few bars introduction by the band, but instead of the usual confident musical sound, all we heard was a hissing noise coming from his cornet. The water key of his instrument, used for releasing condensation, had stuck and the air was escaping. The accompaniment without the solo sounded ridiculous. We stopped and began again, and with great presence of mind, Bill grabbed a cornet from a bewildered colleague and continued with admirable composure. The situation was further redeemed by a perfect performance of McCunn's Land of the Mountain and the Flood, but one wondered whether any German listeners would have been won over to the Allied cause by this particular broadcast. Bill Overton, a great friend and colleague, was a remarkable character. His sheer exuberance and zest for life disturbed many amongst us, particularly in early morning, when he would noisily bound out of bed at 6am, full of the joys of spring, whilst others were feeling like death. His confidence was incredible. To give an example, he came to me one morning imbued with the idea of playing the Haydn Trumpet Concerto with the Brussels Radio Symphony Orchestra. He actually persuaded me to accompany him to Brussels radio station to see the musical director, armed with a letter of recommendation from Ernest Hall, principal trumpet of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, who had also been his professor at the Royal College of Music. We approached the reception desk with courage and school certificate French. To my amazement, Bill came out of that warm and friendly meeting with a provisional date to play the Haydn Concerto subject to permission being given by our commanding RAF officer. Permission was given and some weeks later the projected performance took place after Christmas. The period around Christmas was a worrying one for the people of Belgium and particularly so for those living in Brussels due to the fact that von Rundstedt had launched a massive counter-offensive in the Ardennes and had penetrated Allied lands, thus threatening the capital. Cold, damp, foggy weather and the German advance, which included the dropping of armed parachutists in American uniforms, caused considerable alarm amongst the civilian population and concern amongst the military establishments, and it was some days before the situation eased. On Christmas Eve, my brother and I witnessed the arrest of one such paratrooper outside the Gare du Nord, when an alert British army captain apprehended the German entering the station. We were kept extremely busy playing at concerts both in public and with visits to second tactical air force bases around Brussels. The usual Christmas fare was served up at a large camp on Christmas Day when senior NCOs and officers waited on the men at dinner whilst we played suitable music for the occasion. Air Marshal Conningham read the traditional greetings to the men. Bon ami was everywhere, but was tempered a little when a corporal, very full of everything, got up to reply to the air marshal. 
Thank you, sir, thank you for all this marvellous food, but I wish you would come and try it on a working day. End of chapter 8 To end this podcast, I am going to play Blazon from Andrew Down's Suite for Six Horns or Horn Choir, performed by the Horns of the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra on their CD entitled Andrew Down's Music for Horns and Wagner Tubers, recorded for the Artisman label in 2008. This CD is in memory of Frank Downs. Blazon means armorial bearings, coat of arms, which I thought was appropriate for Frank's journey with the RAF. Thank <laughs> you.